that's all. So first, let's, uh, let's go to prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. I come to you humbly. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm your vessel, Father. I don't want any of this to be of me. I just want it to be completely of you. Your presence, Lord, we, we want it. We want to learn from you. We want to s- seek you in so many different ways, Lord. Lord, humble me. The, uh, it's, a, it's a mighty, mighty thing to be in my brother's pulpit, your, your shepherd that you put over this flock, Lord, and I don't take it lightly. So I pray that uh, the words are, come from you, and I just pray that you'll bless them and, and, and the body here, and then we just we all grow and become have a, more of a personal relationship with you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. So this evening, the, uh, what Pastor Tom asked me to, to continue on is he did Psalm 51 last week. So we're going to start with Psalm 52. Uh, pretty, pretty deep, deep psalm. It's, uh, it's not very often where you, where you have a psalm that's very, very clear on what it is, when it was, and why it was. It's, uh, it's uh, pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. So let me uh, read the psalm to you first, and then we'll go from there. To the chief musician, Mashiel, a psalm of David, when Doag the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of Ahimelech. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place. And root thee out of thy land of the living, Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in his abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done and it will wait on thy name. For it is good before thy saints. The uh, I read from the King James. It's uh, just my preferred Bible. Uh, so there might be a few words that might be a little different there. The uh, pretty pretty deep psalm that's all over the place, right? Uh, a key thing that's really important to understand with this psalm is is context, and the context is going to be pretty deep. So you guys ready to do this? All right. So open your Bibles to First Samuel. Go to the left. So, we can start in 1 Samuel 1, and it's gonna, we're going to do, do, do just a very quick thing with this. So, 1 Samuel 1, so just say amen when you're there. All right, so 1 Samuel is, is one of those books of the Bible that is just powerful. It's like reading a novel. I mean, you could sit there and listen to a tape of 1 Samuel and think you're in a book. I mean, like a, a, just like a novel that has you sitting on the edge. It's all about... Uh, Going from the judges to Hannah and Eli uh, to Hannah basically uh, giving Samuel, her son, where she promised her son to the Lord. And as a little boy, uh, that would be in the first part. So a couple of things where in the very first one is Hannah basically uh, when she was praying because she was barren in the womb. That was her, her big issue. And back in those times, I mean, having kids was the key thing to a woman's prosperity, a woman's wealth or value. And if you weren't able to bring children, then you were, you were felt beneath. And uh, so she prayed for that constantly. That was her big thing. And she prayed so much that, that, that to the Lord, she said, Lord, give me a son and open my womb and I will give you, I, I will give you the child. And that's what she did. So basically, as we, we go through it, for, for she prayed for the child. And as you go through uh, Samuel 2, so we're just sliding over a little bit. We're only going to hit some peaks of this. The, um, so after she gave birth to Samuel, uh, she, w- of course, weaned Samuel and, uh, for a couple, day, uh, couple years and then essentially brought uh, Samuel to Eli and said, this is, this is the son. Eli basically at the time was the high priest. And would basically took Samuel uh, un- under his uh, wing, I guess you could could say. And she bare uh, a couple sons and daughters after that. So moving on to chapter 3. So basically, this is when the Lord speaks to Samuel, right? So basically, Samuel's sleeping, 
and it, it's just going to be caps of uh, highlights of what what's going on first Samuel and the Lord is speaking to uh, to Samuel but Samuel doesn't know it so every time the Lord speaks all he says is here am I and basically gets up and goes to Eli and says I'm here am I I didn't call you go back to bed it happens three times the third time the uh, Eli tells him it's the Lord talking to you if he calls you again say Lord I am here and that's what he did uh, and basically it was that was Samuel's first in interaction with the Lord and it was uh, quite the blessing of, of what he did so the Lord appeared again to him a few times as we flow through in essence, when Samuel was, was the, the t over, over Israel as the judge, if you will, at the time, the, the Israelites were, really wanted a king. There was this strong thing where they just didn't understand that their king was the Lord. And they wanted a king like every other nation. So they kept making this a big issue. Eventually, uh, the, uh, the Lord picked Saul. Saul became the king of Israel, and there were many battles and those type of things, and it goes all the way through, through a couple chapters, and then enters in chapter 17 is, and I think we've all read this many, many times, is basically uh, David and Goliath, right? So David and Goliath, the key thing to know about this is prior to David coming on the scene, and you know, as you guys have gone through the Psalms, you've gone through 51 of the Psalms, you're seeing David's heart all over the place. And, you know, one of the key things is, and it's, it's a, it takes time to grasp exactly what it means when, when the Lord says, David is a man after my own heart. And understanding that is, is understanding that so many have failed at one step, right? So the Lord anointed Saul, but when Samuel told Saul all these things that he was supposed to do, he didn't do them to the fullest of what the Lord said. So he didn't obey the Lord. So hold your spot right there in 1 Samuel 17 and just flip over to Acts 13, 22. And say amen when you're there. All right. So Acts 13, 22 says this. And when he had removed him, he raised up, Onto them, David, to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall, fill, which shall fulfill all my will. Okay, so I'm going to say that one more time. A man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. That's what David did. He fulfilled all the Lord's will in everything that he did. Even throughout his life, when he sinned, he always went back to the Lord. And that's the key thing with this. So in pieces of this in 1 Samuel, before the David and Goliath, where Saul basically did not, um, did not, he was supposed to go into a certain land, destroy everyone, kill everything, and he didn't do that. Um, and came up with excuses of why he didn't do that, thinking it was for the Lord and those type of things. But the Lord was very clear on, this is what I, what, what I want you to do, and he disobeyed the Lord. So he lost that, basically that anointing, if you will. So, understanding how David comes on the scene, David and Goliath happens, right? I think we've all heard that story in, in some shape or form. The, um, the, uh, so, let me go over just some highlights of that. When, and this is really important. See, we, as, as people, we always, I think, you know, at least I do, look on the outside in a lot of different things of what somebody's capability were. If you saw Goliath standing there in front of us, right? Fear would strike us. I mean, it was nine cubits tall. I mean, the, the long spear, long sword, the whole nine yards. And the, the entire Isra Israelite army trembled at his sight, right, and his words. They wouldn't, they wouldn't defend uh, the Lord and go out and battle uh, Goliath. He did it for 40 days. They, that's a very interesting number when you think about it, right? That's the same amount of number that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, right? Same number that that Moses went up into the, the, the Mount Sinai, 40 days, right? So and all these, you know, the thing about the Bible, and I know we all know this, we're here Wednesday night, is everything goes like this, and it's just a thread of Jesus all over the place, and it's just so beautiful in so many ways. So, so three of his older brothers were part of the army that were part of the Israelites, 
and it goes overlooked with the, you know there was eight there was eight sons of Jesse. Uh, yeah, I think you know the, the the verse about the root of Jesse, right? That's where Jesus would come from. That that line. The um, so when so when Samuel was looking to anoint another king, with you know at least anoint, not king yet. The uh, he p- went through every single from the they brought the oldest son first, the second son, the third son, and all the way down to these are all your sons. Well, I have one more son that's out in you know tending to the sheep, and of course that was Daniel. Well, bring him to me, and then it brings him, and the Lord says, that is him. He anoints him. So at that point, a lot of different things are happening in play. When, when Jesse tells um, David to go down and bring a certain amount of food and for certain things down to where the battle was at the uh, brook of Elah, and, uh, or the valley of Elah, that's where um, uh, Goliath was, was slain. In this, the... The, the brothers were basically not, not vindictive, but they weren't, they weren't happy with David being there. They thought he was just being there because he wanted to see the battle. And think of the pride that's going on here. The brothers, who are the older brothers, right, know that for 40 days nobody's gone out there to fight, the, fight uh, Goliath, and he's been there in front of them. So, of course, the, uh, the, uh, uh, David basically says, I'll go, and, you know, volunteers to go. Saul gives him his, his armor, says, hey, I can't do this, right? That can, you know, I have, this has never been tested uh, for him and too heavy, all those other type of things. The, uh, then he goes out, five stones, launches a stone, goes and uh, uh, you know, um, slays Goliath, t- picks up Goliath's sword, cuts off his head, those type of things. And then there's a key verse in, so that we're in 1754. So 1 Samuel, 1754. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent, right? So he put Goliath's armor in his tent. Um, one of those just amazing Holy Spirit facts that just get put in the Bible that you think nothing of until later on in life where the Lord shows you something and you're like, whoa, that's amazing. And we're going to learn all about that. It's pretty exciting. So it goes through. Uh, David and uh, uh, Jonathan uh, become very, very close friends. Their souls are knitted. The, uh, um, and then there's this song, right, that's, that, that keeps coming into play. And the women answered one another, and I'm in uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 7. And the women answered and as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousand and David his ten thousand. So this is, this is when pride, envy, and strife, and all kinds of things are coming into play for Saul, right? Saul's the king, but David's getting all the credit. David's winning the battles. David, and so these things are happening to where the Lord basically puts the e- evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, and that is 19, uh, verse 9. And it happens a couple different times where, where essentially every single time David does something, Saul feels a little bit more threatened. Right? And this is where the things are happening where, where Saul's throwing javelins at him. Um, he, he misses them. Now he's, he keeps saying he wants to kill him and those type of things. And then he comes up with all these deceitful ways to marry my daughter, uh, which was Michael. Uh, and then come up in all these different ways right? for like three chapters of 1 Samuel in this area. And then we're going on to 20. So 1 Samuel 20. He loved, uh, in first 2017, and Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So Jonathan, in these next two chapters, Jonathan and, and David are basically two souls knit to where one is warning the other and basically it, it, to a deceptive way to his own father. So Jonathan is betraying his father by telling David, hey, you need to go, my father's going to kill you, and there's a story of, you know, arrows beyond and those type of things. But the point I want you to take home is the fact that even Jonathan, Saul's son, is betraying Saul because David's done nothing wrong. He's been, it says numerous times, what has he done? He hasn't done anything to you to make you want to kill him. But it's the spirit of what the the Lord gave him. So, So moving on, we're on 21 now. So, and this I'm going to read fully, okay? So 1 Samuel 21. Then came David to Nob, 
to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid of the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Okay, we're going to pause. Okay, David is being tracked down by Saul. Saul's trying to kill him, right? So basically, at this stage, David goes to Himelech, the priest, and is lying to him. That's what's happening right now. He's saying, I'm on a special mission. I got no weapons. I got no nothing. And I'm here because I need food, right? So we're going to go on. It's in verse 3. 1 Samuel 21, 3. Now, therefore, what is under thy hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women, and David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doag the Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen and belonged to Saul. Okay, we're going to pause there. So if you remember from the very first verse of Psalm 52, and I'll read that again, to the chief musician Mashiach, a psalm of David, when Doag the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of, him, of Ahimelech. So this is our introduction to Doag. So Doag is an Edomite and is the chiefest herdsman belonging to Saul, okay, who just happens to be where the priests are in Nob with Ahimelech, right? So let's kind of think about that for a minute. Why is the herdsman there with the priests, right? I mean, who knows? Could be the Holy Spirit working in him to where he's, he's seeking the Lord and just kind of one foot in the world, one foot now, out. We don't know that yet. So moving on to 1 Samuel 21, verse 8. And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thy hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, Take it, for there is no other save that, that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. Pause again. There is the sword of, of Goliath, right? The only time it's mentioned is when Goliath had it, when David put it in his, in his tent, and all of a sudden it ends up in Nob. I mean, it's a pretty amazing fact. These are the only times it's talked about in the Bible. But clearly, somehow, some way, that's where it got, and that's where it was. When it says um, there is no other save that except that, uh, in your whatever version your Bible is, probably uses the word except. But that's where the sword, is, the sword came from. Okay, moving on, verse 10. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. All right, so David fled uh, because now he knows, he already knows he was fleeing before even going to see Hamelech, and now he's fleeing. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has, laid, has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? There's that again. You remember hearing that from previous? So his name is known all, all around the land. And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Pause again. So David was lying to the priest of Himelech, and now he's acting like a crazy man to protect himself. Right? Then said Achish unto his servant, Lo, you see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen, that ye have brought this fellow to play the mad 
man in, in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So chapter 22. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave at Dulam. And when his brethren and all the father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab. And he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, and I pray thee, come forth and be with you, till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart, and get thee in the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Horeth. When Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Same spear that he was holding when, uh, when Goliath was going down for 40 days. All they were doing was holding the spear. When Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? So we're going to pause there. So what Saul is saying, will David give you these things? I'll give you these things. I'll give you fields. I'll give you vineyards. I'll give you all these things. I'll make you captains over thousands and captains over hundreds. Verse 8, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait at this day. And this is as we previously talked about where Jonathan betrayed Saul as well. So Saul's distraught. He's got nobody that's doing anything for him. Verse 9. Then answered Doeg. Remember Doeg? Doeg is the Doag the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of Amalek. That is Psalm 52, verse 1. And here you have it in 1 Samuel 22, verse 9. And answered Doag, right? All this time Doag's been there, and now he answers after he hears, I will give you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, right? Because what was Doag? He was a chief herdsman, right? Pretty low in the kingdom, right, compared to what he's talking about here. Isn't this amazing? This is so much about life, right? When, uh, you know, when, you know the, the ladder of this world, if you will, right? Stepping on each other to move up in careers, life, all those type of things. You know, all you got to do is turn on the news one time and you see it every day. This very, very thing. Somebody talking down somebody else or saying some slanderous word or something to improve their position in the world or whatever they perceive to be their world. So then again, verse 9. Then answered Doag, the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitim. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Right? Doag knew that David came there and, and, and lied. He knew exactly what he said, but that's not what he just said to Saul, is it? He just said, yep, he came there, he wanted, he wanted food, and he wanted a sword, and Ahimelech, was the priest, gave it to him. That's basically what he said. So immediately it looks to Saul as if like Ahimelech is on the side of David, just like his son was, right? Everything he's doing in the, in the concepts of, of, of fear and pride and, uh, you know, Saul, is the fact that he can't trust anybody, and all of a sudden, Doag he can trust. And he inquired of the Lord, verse 10, for him and gave him victuals and, saved, and, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitab, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came, all of them, to the king. So all the priests have now come. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitab. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said unto him, why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of, of Jesse? 
in that thou hast given him bread and a sword and hast inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. And Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house, that I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me, let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. So basically, Himelech, the priest is saying, I, I didn't know anything about this. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and, and did not show it to me, because the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the, of the Lord. So basically, Saul has just now told his footmen, his soldiers, kill all the priests, right? So the footmen are like, whoa, I'm not killing the priests. This is, this. whoa, what, what are we doing here? And the king said to Doeg, verse 18, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and he fell upon the priests and slew on that day fourscore and eighty-five persons that did wear a linen ephod. 85 priests. Doag went from the chief herdsman of Psalm 52 to now he's moved up because, you know, he's been promised vineyards and captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. And he's also just done something that none of the foot soldiers would do. He's just slew 85 priests. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women children and sucklings, which are babies, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. So Doag has just slaughtered everybody, one man. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. And David said on Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doag the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. So David has just realized that he knew because he went there, because of what he did, the lies that he told Ahimelech, that all of them were, sl were slayed by Doeg. So he has just realized that this is my fault. Now imagine the anguish that David is, 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 is at right now. He's, he, he knew when he lied. He knew all those things that he did. And now he is responsible for all of these people being slain. Babies, animals, children, women, all the men, the priests. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing when you sit there and you think about it. That is the context of Psalm 52. And I hope and pray that uh, that, is, that is clear to you that, that where this actually comes from. I'd like to share one more thing with you on this. There's so much more to it. But let's turn to um, Matthew chapter 12. And this is one of the interweavings of the verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was a hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered in the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? For I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy 
and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is the Lord even on the Sabbath day. So red writing, if you have red writing in your Bible, this is Jesus talking about that very, very event. And it's very, very powerful. So turning to Psalm 52. I know that was a long way to get to Psalm 52, huh? Hopefully that, uh, that provided the context of uh, what we're going to be talking about. You know, especially with uh, many of these psalms, as you have you as you listened listened to over last Wednesday nights, there are just so many different times of pain, peaks and valleys of David's life, and this is this is you know one of them as well. So Psalm fifty-two: Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. So in mischief, the one willing to kill, I think we know who that is, and willing to go beyond super lengths to kill, right? The, uh, you know, for, the, for the, the things of that world. I know it's hard to understand exactly what was wealth back then, but animals, prestige, being, being in charge of others, uh, you know, this, the, those comforts were, you know, something that we probably take for granted now, but back then... That was, that, was, that was power. That was pure power to go from a lowly herdsman to being somebody that the king personally trusts to basically do anything he asks. And clearly, he would do anything that Saul asks. If he's willing to kill even one priest, let alone 85, uh, I, think, uh, I think Saul knows that Doag is going to be a, his guy to create sin. And, and realize at this time, you know, that, that Saul has, you know, the spirit of evil with him that the, that the Lord gave him, right? So, so what's happening here is, uh, is, is pretty, pretty uh, amazing. There's a, a thought just came to my mind, and I'm, I don't want to let it go since I know it's from the Holy Spirit here. So the Antichrist, you guys have all heard that, right? So did you know that there's 18 types of Antichrist in the Bible? Let me just list them. And that's all I'm going to do. Cain, Nimrod, Pharaoh, Balak, Sisera, Abimelech, Absalom, Saul, Goliath, Ahab, Jeroboam, Nabal, Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, Solomon, Herod, and Judas. Each one of them have some type of thread of, of the Antichrist. And, it's, uh, and Saul, clearly, you can see that through at least like eight chapters of 1 Samuel to where it's describing the hatred, the pride, the, all the things that are of the devil, right? All right, division, strife, hate, discontent, right? I mean, that's what that's where Lucifer fell in Isaiah 14, right? Pride. So moving on in Psalm four, in Psalm 52. So, O oh, mighty man, of that second verse, or first verse. David is talking about Doeg, a herdsman who became an informer who became a hitman, basically, for Saul, right? The goodness of God. The goodness of God endureth continually. So there's, there's David singing his psalm where he's saying, O mighty man, evil one, right? The goodness of God endureth continually, right? That's showing when we read that in Acts, in Acts 13 about, you know, God's will. Always turning to God. Always turning to God. And that's what David's showing us all the time. Verse 2. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor, working deceitfully, thy tongue, right? Thy tongue is, uh, I think, I think we, the whole Bible talks about thy tongue in so many different ways. But just um, first, let's turn to James, James chapter 3. So go to your right of your Bible. And it's right after Hebrews. In my Bible, it's page 531. Chapter 3, and we're just going to do the first eight verses. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us. And we turn about the whole body. 
Behold also the ships, which thou, they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor lifts us. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Verse 7, For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. Verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So I'm going to read that one more time. It's a word of God, flawless, inerrant. But the tongue can no man tame. No man. We do not have the capability to tame the tongue. It says it right there. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So let me pause there. We all have family. We all have friends. We all have coworkers. And I'm sure we can each list many different times where somebody said something that was like toothpaste coming out of a tooth toothpaste tube. It's not coming back. It is out and it is out forever, right? You're just not going to be able to get it back. And sometimes people say things and it's just like, they're, why did I say that? I mean, we've been, all been there. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're, they're big. But in most cases, in any type of evil deceit of the tongue, perspective matters, content matters. I mean, look at the things we deal with now, right? Text. Let's just talk about that one for a minute. If there is no context in text, I don't care who you are. I mean, some speak it, some don't. But you can take a simple sentence in so many different ways. Tone, none of that exists. Facebook, all those types, you know, which you know, has its good things, I guess, but, but it also has a lot of bad things, right? You know, the more friends you have, the more things get to where they need to be. And, you know, if you don't like everybody's friend posts, I mean, you get my point. I'm, I'm not going to drill into that. But I'm sure each and every one of you, if you've ever been on Facebook, have seen somebody say something vulgar, mean, hurtful, deceitful, something where it offended somebody else, where they unfriended them, and, you know, God forbid, it was a family member that unfriended another family member, then the family member division, all those things come into play. And I think you guys know what I'm talking about. The tongue, right? When you look at the fellowship of a church, and I'm just going to kind of settle here for a minute, this is the power of the fellowship of the church. Um, the owner of Facebook recently said that he would basically thinks that Facebook should become the new church where people start having church on Facebook, right? Because it's the same thing. That's how they interact. That's how we, they, we are perceived in the world that we could do it. However, there's no fellowship in that. There's no tone. There's no, there's no piercing into somebody's heart when you see the sadness or you see their happiness or you see their joy because those are the things that make you ask that second sentence, right? I mean, you've seen somebody's confidence down where you say, hey, you got a minute? Can I pray with you? You know, or you just want to talk? Those things you don't know through text or, or Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all those other crazy social media things. And let's just think about this for a minute. Why are all those things so readily available to us? We can put anything out there because, the, the you know, the, of this world, the prince of this world is Satan, right? So if it's working for Satan, why is he going to get rid of it? So think about that for a minute. Right? Everything that is completely holy to the Lord, we always reach a battle where the devil's trying to destroy, trying to take down churches, take down pastors, take down marriages, all these things. Do you see him trying to take down anything associated with social media? I haven't. And if you have, I'd love to hear it after, after the sermon. But so clearly, Satan is involved in that. I mean, call it for what it is, right? So each of you have your own footprint in the world of what that is. Those of us in the military get trained in a lot of different things of what to do and what not to do on social media. But it is a very, very dangerous thing. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Back to the tongue. These things that hurt people are, are sin is just piles on top of each other. Pastor John, uh, Calvary Chapel um, 
Bartlett in Tennessee said this amazing thing. And he was basically talking about forgiveness. And he goes, he goes, think about it. Forgiveness is the hardest thing. But the Lord, even when he talked to Peter, talks about forgive, forgive your brother 70 times, seven times, as many times as it takes. Because forgiveness is one of those things that, that puts each of us in prison when we don't forgive, right? You are, in, you are in bondage to whatever that is that you're not forgiving, as well as being forgiven. Just pause and think about that. Somebody you may have known, something that's happened in your life that was just very hard to forgive. I mean, there's, you know, just always these amazing stories of, uh, you know, some death, some murder, and some father or some mother forgives the person that committed such a heinous crime, right? I, I couldn't imagine what type of person, what relationship they have with the Lord that they're able to do that. You know, thankfully, that's, has, I haven't been tested in that way. But the ones that, that have been tested in that way and have shown that type of faith in God, how powerful is that? I mean, that is just an amazing thing to think about that your son or daughter was murdered, but yet you have forgiven the person that murdered them, right? And there's so many different stories like that. But the point is, is where Pastor John was talking about, he goes, forgiveness is one of those things that is a jail cell that will just hold on to you like you wouldn't believe. And it comes in layers. The first thing is forgiveness. And sin is just piled on sin. Then slander, deceit, all the things that happen. And you're seeing them right here, right? Isn't this what Doeg's doing, right? It's the exact same thing where it's just just pure, pure hatred and just certain things, right? So the tongue, right? And I'll say that I'm going to say this one, one verse. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, a world of sin. It's a world of sin. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it set, set on fire of hell. Fire of hell, right? And I don't think I need Wednesday night crew. I don't think we need to go too much in the differences between heaven and hell. But the, the, they are very real. They're very existent. And, you know, as, as for me, I want to be the things of heaven, of eternal life, of God, of the Lord, things that are not evil and those type of things. And, um, and we can't do any of this on our own. We can't do any of this on our own. We have to do it in Jesus, right? And he's saying it right there. Man cannot bridle the tongue. So if you need that help, that, that additional just go to the Lord on your knees. Be humble and go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a problem with this. I speak out of turn. I just don't think sometimes before I shouldn't. Or I have a friend that does this and just think of all those things. Just keep ask, keep seeking the Lord on all of that. All right, so I'm going to move on. I got to finish Psalm 52. <laughs> so, the, uh, so verse 3. Thou lovest evil more than good and lying rather than speak righteousness. Selah. I think I've kind of just said all of that. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. So there's God basically in, this, in the Psalm of David where he's talking about the evil that you just did, the lies that you just did to, to, to assassinate and slay all those women and children and 85 priests because of your tongue right? That's what did it, right? The tongue did that. Even, you know, Doeg's the man, but he spoke lies. He spoke slander. He spoke the things that Paul wanted to hear, or Saul wanted to hear at that time, and didn't even tell the whole truth. Lies, deceit. Verse 6, the righteous all shall, shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. So the righteous, right? One's in the Lord. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. This one speaks to me so much because it's, it's one of these things where in this world that we live in, that, you know, one foot in, in heavenly things and one foot in the worldly things of a, of a career, of a 401k, of all these things that make you do things, that, that make you work 70, 80 hours a week to where you are spending less time in the word, less time in seeking God, where it says it right there, that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. I mean, there's so many different verses in the Bible, so many different passages that talk about 
you know, Jesus. I mean, there's so many red words in here that where he's talking about that very thing, you know. You know, where the Lord, you know, the, the sparrows, you know, all those things. Verse 8, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. That's David, right? Green olive tree, life, right? Vibrant life, newness, always the Lord, right? Water, living water. Verse 9, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. In this anguish moment where he's told of what of him going there, and he knew that he saw Doag, and he knew and he knew that trouble would come. All the this this pain and suffering of all the, the, the you know the, the priests dying, the women and children. When David hears this, what does he do? He goes right to the Lord, right? Which is exactly what Acts 13, 22 says, right? A man after God's own heart, God's will. Always, no matter what the situation, going to the Lord. And that's what this psalm is about. It's just unbelievably beautiful. So with that, let's go in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for, for your word. Thank you for this living book that just pierces our souls to where we can see you we can know you we can you've given us the the truth you've given us you've given us your son you've given us so much lord and it's just it's an amazing that that we have this it's amazing that so many people never even pick it up lord lord we here love you so much we 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 want to know your you better we want to know your word lord lord and i pray that this word has just been something that where each of us gain something from it to where we have a stronger relationship with you to where even if it's one time, Lord, when we wouldn't normally come to you with a small problem or a big problem or whatever it would be where we think in our own strength that we can handle it, that we just pause and go, I remember Psalm 52. I remember that God is my strength. And just go to your word and just drop to our knees and pray to you and give it all to you, Lord. Lord, we can't imagine your death on the cross. We can't imagine the, the, what love it took to die for these sins of ours that we've had, that we commit, all these things, Lord. You died for each and every one of them. Every time we've said something of where we've lied or we stole or anything like that, Lord. But you have forgiven us. You have, you have cleansed us with your blood. Father, we are so thankful for that. We are just humbled by the fact that you love us to that degree, Lord. Lord, and we pray, we pray that, that in our lives that we will share your word, that we will just introduce somebody that is, doesn't know you, Father. Because, Lord, as your word says, there is hell and there is heaven. And those that do not know you are going to hell. That's where they're going, Lord. Lord, and I pray that we, as your, 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 your children, look at them as even Doeg. Doeg went to hell, Lord, I'm sure. The, uh, I mean, you're the judge, you know. But that evil and those things, Lord, I just pray that as those opportunities arise, that we'll have the boldness to just speak your word, to just share the gospel, plant the seed, Lord. You, your spirit will do the rest, Lord. You, it's on you. Our job, as you say in this word, is just to share it. Lord, and I pray that we will do that. Lord, thank you for this evening. Lord, and again, bless, bless my brother Tom and his, his, as the missionaries that are over there in Japan. Just give him that cur encouragement, Lord. Just make those opportunities come abound and just let them come back and tell us some amazing stories of how somebody got saved, Lord, another person in your kingdom. Lord, humbly, we, we come before you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The, uh, the Agape Got boxes are in the, out in the hallway. So all the, for on Wednesday nights, any, any tithes or offerings that you do give, go to uh, the missionaries. Uh, and it's just uh, an amazing thing. Thank you for being here this evening. And uh, pray that you'll have a blessed week. And we'll see you on Sunday.